welcome. Hello. Uh, <laughs> we're in this interview with uh, Michael McFadden, if I'm correct. Um, today, we're just really happy to have Michael with us, um, telling him, um, telling us about some of his artistic process and just telling us some um, information or facts about uh, the pieces that's currently exhibiting in our show, um, Mirror to the World. Uh, my name is Christina Chen, and together, um, we will uh, be joining this interview. So let's start off with a really simple question. How are you today, Michael? I'm, I'm doing very well. Um, mm -hmm. Feeling good, uh, wide awake. <laughs> <So> <laughs> should go pretty well. Okay, that's, that's very nice to hear. Um, would you mind telling us some of uh, about your background and how did you get into art in the first place? Just something about yourself. Okay. Um, well, I'm originally from Fort Wayne, Indiana. I'm a Midwesterner. Um, the only art in my house growing up was a painting of a ballerina that mm -hmm. my uncle had done when he was in art school. Oh. And that painting sat above my mother's piano. My mother was mm -hmm. a musician. So that was like a cultural center that didn't exist anywhere else in my house. And I really had very little exposure to fine art. Mm -hmm. uh, until I really until I went to college um, I had a few initial experiences where you know um, the, my art teacher said I should go to uh, he, um, a, a cl class at the local art school you know and I did that but I was pretty much uh, being prepared for a career in engineering and science oh. at that time. <laughs> yeah. a very different path <laughs> oh it sure is <laughs> and I was good at the things that you need to be good at. You know, um, I, I was good at math and good at science. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the space program, with the space program, everything, everybody in high school, if you had any aptitude for engineering at all, you were pushed in that direction. And I had, there were engineers that would call me to see how I was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, they took me to Chicago, to the University of Chicago, to see the cyclotron. This was mm -hmm. all part of this young engineer thing. So, and uh, meanwhile, I've always made things. I spend probably 90% of my time working with my hands, and I always have, mm -hmm. um, even when I was very young. And so there's always been this uh, struggle between my, my, you know, the science and math thing, and then my, what I really wanted to do was work with my hands. My, my, my parents were reluctant to encourage me in the direction of art for all the same reasons most parents are reluctant to take <laughs> I believe so. Mm -hmm. And my mother had the added advantage of uh, having a, a brother who was an artist. And uh, I loved to go see him and I loved the smells in his studio. And I, you know, I just going into the studio, I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to play with all the tools, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, but he had a rough life, you know, he, he always needed never quite had enough money, you know, his wife mm -hmm. had to work. And, mm -hmm. uh, so she didn't want, want me to have that kind of a life. You know, she wanted my life to be easier. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, I realized I didn't want to have anything to do with science and math. There were, I was surrounded by people who were really good at those subjects and were naturals in it and were willing to work really hard to be better at it. And I didn't have any of those motivations. I was just good at that stuff. And mm -hmm. so by the time I got to college, being good at it wasn't enough. You also had to kind of love it, you know, yeah. be really dedicated to it. I couldn't love it. So um, I, there was a building on campus that was the arts center. It was where the studios were. And uh, there was a workshop there too. And anyone on campus could go to this building, it was called Bolio, and you could go to the workshop. And so I discovered, I was spending most of my time at, in the workshop in Bolio. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, so I was around the art majors and I just really, oh, I wanna be, I, I, you know, I wanna be like them. <laughs> I, mean, I, wanna, <laughs> I wanna be able to do this all the time. Mm -hmm. And so, by the end of my sophomore year, I switched my major to art. Mm -hmm. I didn't have enough credits, so I went to Pratt that summer. So that was my first exposure in New York. 
I got off of a subway train in the middle of Bedford Stuyvesant, you know, and I didn't know where I was. Um, and that was a summer when there were a, a, there was a lot of Black Power marches mm -hmm. and things like that. And every morning out in the park, the, there was Congo playing and people marching. It was a really dynamic time. Yeah. <laughs> so um, when I then I just for the rest of my career at, at undergraduate school, I just you know, was an art major, and I got my work contract job was supervising the workshop because I. Because I was always making things as a child, I knew all about tools. You know, I used a table saw when I was in junior high school. I, you know, I was really, you know, and uh, so I had skills that I could teach other people in the shop. Mm -hmm. um, in at Carl, the first style I, that I uh, embraced was constructivism. I had a sculpture professor. And I was good at making things. I had never really tried to paint. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought, well, I must be a sculptor. A sculptor. And he uh, he directed me towards the constructivist, Noam Gambo and Antoine mm -hmm. Hevsner, mm -hmm. Russian constructivist, um, as a baby. He had me study them. And uh, that was really the first time I'd ever studied art you know, or an artist. Mm -hmm. And um, while I was at Pratt, I learned to weld. There was a basement welding shop and uh, I loved welding. So oh. when I got back to Carlton, I was making structures, geometric structures with linear surfaces, mm -hmm. kind of like Pepsner or more like a bow, I suppose. And um, so that's what I did at Carlton. I was doing pretty much when at the end of my time there, I started doing a few paintings. Um, so after I graduated from Carleton, I wasn't quite sure what to do because mm -hmm. I didn't really feel entitled to be an artist. <laughs> and uh, I was, actually felt more entitled to be a musician because very early my mother got me started in music and I played music mm -hmm. and so forth. And I worked pretty hard at that, but I just wasn't, again, it was a thing where I didn't love it enough to be. <laughs> <laughs> that committed to. Uh -huh. so eventually, I, uh, uh, I, a friend of mine, uh, told me that she thought I could get a teaching fellowship at Purdue, in the art department. Mm -hmm. So I thought I didn't really have much portfolio from undergraduate school, and I know I needed a good portfolio to get into a good graduate school. So I went to Purdue to build up my portfolio. Meanwhile, because they gave me a teaching fellowship. You know, it paid for me to get my master's there. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at a lot of other schools to go to after that, and I wound up with at Wisconsin. I had some professors, uh, one professor in particular at Purdue, who was from Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And um, I wound up going to the University of Wisconsin in, in Madison. And that's where I completed my MFA. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of my studies at Wisconsin, some friends of mine and I, joined this, or applied to this contest from the Pabst Brewery Company, wanted young artists to paint a mm -hmm. mural mm -hmm. of the history of beer making. <laughs> okay. oh. <laughs> and this mural was to be 10 feet tall and 60 wow. feet long. It was oh. huge. You know? <gasps> and this is really the first experience I had with painting. But mm -hmm. so four of us each sort of took a section and developed the composition, then put them together, and then we spent a whole summer in Mil in Milwaukee in, a, in one of Pabst's garages, painting this mural. And there was a prize for winning this competition, it was, and so I took that prize money, and that's how I moved to New York. Mm, oh, that's, that's how I got there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, certainly it sounds like there you went through a lot of different paths and I would say different people to um, find what you love, I would say, maybe. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, it wasn't it was uh, <clears throat> it wasn't a real direct path. Mm -hmm. And the biggest problem was that uh, I really didn't have people around me that mm -hmm. I could emulate. You know, I think it's mm -hmm. a problem for a lot of artists. I think it's mm -hmm. really important. Like my wife and I are both artists and. Mm -hmm. uh, we we love to have people young young artists come into our, our where we work 
because I know how important it is for them to see what artists really do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so looking at your artworks, they're abstract, and I'm just wondering, um, could you tell us a little bit about the connections, um, you and your work, and what are the reasons for you choosing your subjects of your um, artworks? Okay. <clears throat> um, I've, I've gone in a lot of different directions with art as well as with career and everything else, you know. Yeah. So I've tried a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. I've always been better at more ge geometric, more conceptual mm -hmm. uh, parts of art. Mm -hmm. um, although I've, like working on that mural, I did a painting of this king from Europe, you know, an oil painting. And I mean, it was realistic and looked like him and so forth. But it wasn't something that I had a lot of experience with. So um, I didn't choose to be an abstract artist. Mm -hmm. I chose to be the kind of artist I wanted to be, mm -hmm. which meant I had to find out who I was mm -hmm. and, and be true to myself and honest to myself. Mm -hmm. And when I did that, the work that I make and make now, people call abstract. I never mm -hmm. intended it to be abstract. I never did, oh, I'm gonna make abstract paintings. Mm -hmm. It just evolved to that. And uh, it actually took me by surprise when I started showing the work. Uh, I, sh I started showing the work much later in my life. Mm -hmm. um, but when I started showing the work, it was immediately classified as abstract. Mm -hmm. And I really hadn't necessarily thought of it that way. Uh, mm -hmm. So I had to, well, anyway, yeah. Um, well, then, um, could you also tell me a little bit about the process of, you know, like constructing your art and thinking about what you want to paint and just the entire process of it. Could you tell us about that? Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm a maker. Mm -hmm. Okay. Flat out. I, I, I know that, I've known it my whole life. I know I'm entitled to it. I'm not necessarily, didn't necessarily feel like I was entitled to be an artist, mm -hmm. right? So I started as, as maker. Then I learned to be an artist. So when I started making art, I didn't really know what this art thing was all about, you know? Uh, learning about Gabo and Pastor, and that was a real revelation to me. Um, and, and so I always felt like I was starting from behind, you know. <laughs> but um, what I wound up doing, because I'm a maker, my art is constructed. Mm -hmm. I construct my paintings, I construct sculpture, I build it from parts. Um, so the final product is a result of a lot of choices. I try to make all those choices open-ended, so I'm not really ever completely sure what the work is going to look like when I'm finished. I leave mm -hmm. myself open to things changing along the process. Uh -huh. um, so, um, like, and I reject a lot of things that other artists learn and use. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 making my living, I, I made my living for a lot, 16 years as a teacher, teaching mm -hmm. art, engineering, and art and engineering. And, um, so I taught linear perspective. I mm -hmm. taught students how to draw in linear perspective. And I taught them how to do it manually on a board. I also taught them how to do it in CAD. So that's what oh. I, I, I could do those things, you know. Uh-huh, it's could wonderful. CAD. I was one of the first people into CAD, you know, and all that, you know, it, anyway. So, um, but I don't use linear perspective in my work. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to explain, except that I'm so aware of what it is, that when I look at a painting that has linear perspective, I see the lines, mm -hmm. you know, I and mean, there's, I see the structure, I see things, you know, I see what's there, you know. Mm -hmm. I can usually tell you whether something's from a photograph or not, because a photograph is naturally done, has linear perspective, you know. Mm -hmm. So I can usually tell if a painting is done just simply whether or not it has that photographic linear perspective. Mm -hmm. I made a deliberate choice not to have that in my work. Mm -hmm. I was also better at what you would call the abstract things than I was at the uh, 
the uh, representational illusion. Mm-hmm. Right? So I knew that was the direction I wanted to go. Mm-hmm. Um, it, I think the next question was, or the next part of the question was, uh, uh, how do you work or how do you form your ideas? Uh, okay. So when an idea captures my imagination, the kind of ideas that capture my imagination are often involve a person in a place mm-hmm. having a kind of uh, real a, 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 an experience that was a little bit profound. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, one of the pieces I'm working on now mm-hmm. are about swimming in a natural pond mm-hmm. where there's all kinds of gross things, um, you know, swimming around in it with you, and there's mm-hmm. animals, and, and there's plant, you know, in other words, it's not necessary, it might be beautiful, but mm-hmm. it's also intimidating because there's a lot of unknown things. Mm-hmm. So, and I kind of think of that as a metaphor for, for imagination. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I collect things. I do I have lots of sketchbooks. I draw things. I, I, I'll look at something and say, oh, you know, I want to remember that, collect it. So, I'm constantly collecting things, uh, images and shapes. Mm-hmm. Um, the next step, I, I, the next step is trying to pick a theme. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a method I've developed over years. And, and so I understand these themes that come through art history, like a still life mm-hmm. or a portrait. Okay, those are very simple. Or, or a landscape with a river running through it. You know, there are these certain themes that run throughout art. Mm-hmm. And so I try to fit my choices into an art historical theme. So I try to make it specific and universal at the same time. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, the way I actually arrive at the image is through collage. Mm-hmm. Uh, usually, when I say these things, it's all usually, you know, I mean, I yeah. also do all the other things too. You know, but mm-hmm. the way I like, you, right? <clears throat> I, mm-hmm. I arrive at the image through collage. And the way I do that is, I'm looking over here because I have all these boards now. Where I, that I can, can you kind of see that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, pieces are falling off of it. Oh, it's but, okay. So these pieces are the pieces that I make. So here's a little piece I made. Can you see that? Mm-hmm. Oh, mm-hmm. Okay. So it's rice paper. It's very thin. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I made this, I might cut it out first and then paint on it, or I might paint it and then cut it out, or I might take a shape and draw inside the shape, all the different variations that you could do with, with a brush and ink on rice paper. Mm-hmm. And then I wound up with hundreds of pieces like this, <laughs> all different sizes and shapes and colors, right? Mm-hmm. And then I take that theme and I look at those pieces and I try to create an image using these pieces that fits into that theme. So, so the pieces I'm using are not representational, they're not illusionistic, they're mm-hmm. this, these things like this, but I'm putting them together mm-hmm. to create an image. It's almost like a puzzle, I would say. It is. There's a lot of problem solving involved. There's a huge amount of problem solving involved. Quite frequently, you know, I, I say I make, make 200 pieces, mm-hmm. but uh, as I'm finished with one composition, I have fewer pieces. Then if I make another composition, then I have it even fewer. So eventually I just have a few pieces. Mm-hmm. And I love that. I love a challenge. I love taking <laughs> those leftover pieces and making mm-hmm. something out of them, you know, fitting them into one of my themes. And quite often that's my best work is when mm-hmm. I'm left with just these things that mm-hmm. I have to use, but that didn't necessarily intend. Well, I would say certainly the entire process of um, you uh, thinking about what what the subjects are, and then like creating these little pieces, and then trying to figure out how it well represents what you want to tell your viewers. I think it is certainly amazing. It is. It sounds very hard to do, actually. Um, I don't think of it as hard to do because mm-hmm. I've always been careful to mm-hmm. do what I want to do. I never had a lot of pressure on mm-hmm. what to do because I didn't start showing and selling my work till a few mm-hmm. years ago. Most of my life, I've 
had some kind of a job to support my family. Those were jobs that were related to art. Like I said, I taught engineering and architecture and, uh, and, and art. You know, I also taught art uh, in, in high school. Uh, but I also spent years as a cabinet maker in New York, uh, building mm -hmm. furniture. That's how I made mm -hmm. my living in New York. Mm -hmm. And then I spent year, a few years working in an engineering office. And so mm -hmm. I have many different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and so it was always up to me to choose what I wanted to do next, mm -hmm. rather than having any pressure on me to conform mm -hmm. to a certain style or, or type of work so I could sell it or please somebody else. Mm -hmm. For most of my life, it's always been for me. <laughs> it's always been. Um, of course, well, prior to our interview, I've read through your bio or your statement, and I remember if correctly, um, some of your works, they're drawn upon your memories and experience that are uh, poignant. Um, but uh, some of these works of yours, they, they're very vibrant in color, like the red and the blue. And I would say like some of them even look very cheerful. And I was wondering if that contrast, you know, between the color you're using and the memories that you're drawing upon, is that contrast intentional or is just turned out how it is? Well, um, I've taught, I taught design at Purdue and I taught design at Wisconsin and I've taught mm -hmm. design classes around here, you know, and, and so contrast is the most powerful tool you have. Mm -hmm. visual art. You know, mm -hmm. you don't see anything if you don't have contrast, you know, That's it's true. huge, true. right? It's huge. And I, my personal taste is to go towards things that have really maximized that contrast. Mm -hmm. So uh, black ink on white paper, mm -hmm. I love, I love doing brushwork in black ink on, on, on paper. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons, and uh, so the contrast is really important to me at the same mm -hmm. time. One of the things that I have, you know, I, you work as long at something as I have, and I, you know what you're good at, right? You know, mm -hmm. I know I'm good at color. So, I, and, and not colorless representational color, but color in the abstract sense. I, I understand it, you know, I've taught it. Uh, uh, I have my own personal taste. Um, so that's where the color comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, again, it's like, I've chosen to be that. And I know that you've been using rice paper, right? Um, I apologize because I'm not really knowledgeable on rice paper, but I would say that I don't really see people using rice paper a lot, um, using this medium. I'm just wondering what inspired you to use rice paper and what do you like about rice paper? That you, I think you're, you're using it continuously in your work, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. One of the first uh, experiences you, most people have with rice paper is when they do a woodblock print or something like that, because it's mm -hmm. a traditional material to use the print because it's thin so you can get a good print. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of different kinds of rice papers. And so uh, at some point I realized I liked working on rice paper and I kept trying different kinds. And there were qualities to the rice paper that I really liked in the beginning. One was just how it took ink. Another was how I could, how things would spread if they were really mm -hmm. wet. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the, the paper that I use, this is, this is a piece of it. It's called Kitty and it's very, very thin. It's almost transparent. And it has that brown cast. I like the color of it. I like the surface of it. Um, and I've just stuck with it because I've never gotten what I wanted from anything else. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've tried other things. One of the things I like about the rice paper, okay, so I start off by just doing drawings on rice paper. Mm -hmm. Then I realized I could glue it very easily down to paper because it's so thin, it takes the glue, so it just goes down flat like wallpaper almost. Mm -hmm. And so I started using it as collage material. And um, I've just, it's been my go-to material ever since. Uh, I like using the, the big, big brushwork, you know, the sloppy brushwork, and I like the way the paper absorbs the ink and the paint. Mm -hmm. And then the biggest thing is that what I do with it, uh, you can see 
back. Oh, I'm looking at myself. This pain right here. I'll, uh -huh. I'll give you a better look at that in a minute. Can you see that? Yeah, of course I can see it. Okay, so um, this is made out of those pieces of rice paper glued down to a piece of linen. Mm -hmm. um, you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the rice paper is obviously lighter than the linen. You can mm -hmm. see the right mice paper already had marks on it. Mm -hmm. One of the things I do is I paint the pieces on the linen or the canvas so mm -hmm. that I have all these extra marks that are mm -hmm. left over from, you know, from the painting process. And then I try to, then they become incorporated in the fine painting. So this thing about the rice paper is that when I use rabbit skin glue to glue it down on the linen or the canvas. Mm -hmm. And the rabbit skin glue sucks right down into the paint, into the canvas so that if you saw this close up, you'd see that the rice paper has the same texture as the canvas. You mm -hmm. don't even lose the texture, it's so thin. It just wow. becomes almost one with the material you're painting on. Mm -hmm. That's another one of the things I like about it. So I, can, I continually come back to it as a, as a material that I like to use. Mm -hmm. um, just... <laughs> no, no, thank you for showing us um, your work. It's very exciting. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so I know from the start of our interview, you explained that, you know, on your way of from discovering that you actually want to be an artist, um, you've gone through many paths and you were very scientistic based on uh, you were learning science and everything. Um, um, would you say that there's any artist uh, who influenced on your way um, and now you're creating this kind of art? Um, can you think of any artist uh, that influenced you or you like? Yeah. Well, as because I didn't really know anything about it until I got to college, you know, I have a pretty clear idea of where I went and what my path was. So as mm -hmm. I said, I started off with Gabo, mm -hmm. you know, the Russian constructivists. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and then I started to see other kinds of painting. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a lot of favorite artists. One of my most favorite, one of the people that influenced me the most from early on was Du Buffet. Mm -hmm. I just loved Du Buffet's work. And it was so contrary to an academic way of working, you know, or, or a scholarly or schooled work, way of working. Mm -hmm. um, so he was one of my early heroes. And of course, all the people that are all, you know, all the impressionists and other things painters that everyone else is, is, is certainly uh, admires, you know, um, but also Miro. And now my, I admire Miro, even though I may not really understand him. I have a book, of, it's a, a book, a printed copy of his, some sketchbooks and with a lot of text that he's written. And I just, he, he had, I mean, he went from being pretty traditional, almost Cubist painter, to just doing what he did eventually, which is just so free, you know, mm -hmm. so, so uh, surreal almost or something. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, when you read what he's written, he chose not to do what everybody else was doing. Mm -hmm. He deliberately chose to find his own path. Mm -hmm. And so that, that certainly is an influence to me. Uh, there was also an artist, that, when I moved to New York, there was a show on called The Bad Painting Show. Mm -hmm. uh, it was ordered by Marsha Tucker. And uh, bad painting, I don't know if you're aware of what bad painting is, but... Oh, I, I don't of, think I'm too sure. Okay. Well, one, do you know who Neil Jenny is? Neil I think Jenny? I've heard. Yeah. Well, he was in that show. In other mm -hmm. words, his paintings were very effective, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and really, you got a strong sense of meaning from him. But he didn't look like he knew how to paint that well. You know, he, he used very thin paint, so you could see all the brush strokes. He, obviously, he, he knew what he was doing. You know, but it looked different than other people's. And the way it was organized spatially, uh, he did a lot of things that, were, that involved here and there. You know, like this, uh, this, this is over here and this is over there on a canvas. So 
locating things in almost a 3D spatial way on a two-dimensional surface. Mm -hmm. And that really appealed to me because I was coming into painting from having done sculpture. So, um, but, well, there's a couple anyway, a couple of people I've admired. <laughs> okay. Well, um, so I know that uh, according, well, I've read your statement again and um, the way you're explaining your work of process, I would say that um, you do favor intuition and um, those accidental discovery, um, doing those puzzle and everything. So do you think, um, looking at that kind of um, feature of your work, do you work in a really fast uh, pace or do you uh, take time and then going through your work really slowly and figure out how you want to do it? Um, do you think you work in a really fast time? Well, it's both. Okay, if I had my choice, I would work fast and gestural all the time. I think that I'm most excited by what I do when I'm working in that way. But then a problem comes up and you have to solve the problem. And one of the things I love about painting is solving the problems, you know. Uh, I, I, I love it so much that, you know, I, I challenge myself with painting. I don't like try to do a painting I know I can do. I try to do something I haven't done before. It's a challenge. Okay. So, um, well, um, beside from being a fine artist, I know you're also very good at craft craftsmanship. Um, you also have a variety of knowledge, you know, and different experiences. Um, and I'm just wondering at this point of your career, is there anything else that you would want to try? Like whether it's, you know, different medium or different style or anything you want to like, I would say extend from your career. Is there anything like that in your mind? Well, I'm always trying to evolve my work. I'm always trying to do something new. Mm -hmm. And uh, you saw it in the series of you, you, you see that change, these changes. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm always learning, and I'm always trying new things. I'm always trying new materials. I did a series of, I make these uh, collages, can you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is those little pieces, and I do this on paper also. So that's something I tried, and then I did a painting of it. Down there, mm -hmm. okay, which is very different from my other paintings. Mm -hmm. um, very hard edges, and yeah, you can see the, the pieces, pieces in it, and everything. Mm -hmm. But um, that was just a. It was a try. It was an attempt to do something in a different way. I've, uh -huh. I've tried to do that same subject in about four or five different ways. Oh. I often think that I would think sometimes I think. If somebody saw my work, they'd think it was five different painters doing it. Because you know? <laughs> I'm always doing, trying to change things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not even just trying, it's just, sometimes I think I can't do anything twice. Mm -hmm. I have like a bad memory or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, well, certainly, um, I would say having more style is certainly very exciting. It's very interesting, actually. Oh, thank you. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I know that you mentioned that you're working on a piece with a pond. Um, so are you working on multiple pieces or is that the only one that you're working on? Well, this is the pond. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, this was the first version of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this version, I was pretty happy with. I like this pond image because you know, at some point I realized that all these leftover pieces I was talking about, I could put them all in the pond, you know? <laughs> right? They could just be floating around in the pond, you know? Uh -huh. So that's where it started from. And, 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 and now this one I didn't like. I thought there was too much space in it. I wanted to get uh, a little more larger pieces in closer contact with each other. That's mm -hmm. what I've been doing lately with my work, is mm -hmm. I've been sort of inflating the objects so that they take mm -hmm. more space up. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, so then this was the second one. Mm -hmm. And you can see that the pieces are bigger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is. And it's denser. Mm -hmm. But the subject is still a palm. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. 
So this is my latest piece. I'm also working on something that's part of a series that I call uh, Rain on Water. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. These are beautiful. Thank you. And um, I've probably done a dozen of different versions of this. Mm -hmm. So I just started a new one. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just in the unpainted stage. So I'm playing around with all the different ways of making the, the big circles and the splashes. Mm -hmm. So this has about, I would say it has at least a dozen layers of paint on it, where I've gone oh. back over and over again. When I started it, all these short shapes were way too regular. They were ellipses. Mm -hmm. They were the way rain really would look when you hit the water. And that was mm -hmm. never my point, you mm -hmm. know? And, and I knew from doing the quick sketches that I liked these more irregular shapes. So that's where this one's starting. Okay, so that's what I'm working on. Mm -hmm. And then I also, I'm usually working on something three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. Now, this, this was just, I just had an idea, and I, I'm not, I don't even think of this as a piece, but this is something I just decided to do, you know, uh -huh. because I, I had the idea. I, I mm -hmm. like to build three-dimensional things out of planar materials, mm -hmm. you know, using flat materials and, and putting them in and, and making three-dimensional objects out of them. So, uh, and then another thing that I'm working on, and haven't gotten too far with, is uh, I have all these uh, different shapes of wood. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So uh, I'm starting to use these blocks of wood the way I use the paint, the rice paper. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm just trying to think of this as the rice paper, but now put it in a three-dimensional format. Mm -hmm. So I'm building this figure out of things that were not made to build a figure, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? But like this shape right here, see those mm -hmm. shapes? Yeah. Those don't look like feet, but they're really expressive. Mm -hmm. They're more like the motion of a foot or something. Mm -hmm. you know? okay. So you can do things when you're not so concerned about making a copy of reality mm -hmm. that are pretty exciting. <laughs> you know? So that's another thing I'm working on. Mm -hmm. um, this dog mm -hmm. is our dog who recently died so quite often oh. there'll be something that happens in my life mm -hmm. that will wind up in my painting yeah it was a very sad thing you know, I'm he sorry. Had for 16 years mm -hmm. he, uh, and uh, my, my wife teaches art and uh, our, uh, uh, our and so he was kind of the studio dog and everybody, mm -hmm. all of her students would come in and he would mm -hmm. look in their purses for food. And, you know, oh, and so, so he's a, so a sweet. character too. <laughs> yeah. So he often shows up in my work. Uh -huh. uh, there, at a certain point, I realized I was always going to have stronger feelings about things that I knew mm -hmm. than things that were just fantasy. So mm -hmm. now I don't really worry about what to paint anymore. Mm -hmm. I know what to paint. Um, you can't see me, can you? Uh, I paint my life. You know, I paint. I paint the things that are in my life, and I'm very lucky because right outside that window mm -hmm. is the Musconetcong River. This is a mill that I'm in, sitting mm -hmm. probably 15 feet off of the Musconetcong River, mm -hmm. and so I can look out my windows and see an infinite number of interesting things to paint and work mm -hmm. with. <laughs> so I, a lot of my work is like that. Here's something like this is this painting down here. Oh, it's so pretty. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, this was, this was, this was a good one. That's the river, right? Mm -hmm. The blue. And this mm -hmm. is ice along the edge of the river. Uh -huh. and, and this perspective, we can go up to the third floor and look down at the river. So we're almost oh. we're at a 45. So my view of things is often at a 45 degree angle. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's always geese out there. 
So these, remember, these all start off to be pieces of rice paper and I picked them and then I tried to make this up. So these geese are made out of pieces that were not really intended to be geese. Mm -hmm. um, and when I first did this, you know, I do a lot of sketches and, and, and studies. And when I first did it, the geese were real, more of a realistic size in proportion to the river. Then as I did more and more, I started to inflate them until, I, until it became this. You know, and, and as I did that, it became more abstract and, and probably more for, forceful. Mm -hmm. um, the thing I was happiest with in this painting is the ice. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm constantly trying to find metaphors, visual metaphors for things that other people might just draw to look like, right? Like how, how would you paint ice to look like mm -hmm. ice? Mm -hmm. Well, um, for me, that's even more complicated because I have to find a, an abstract, simple, straightforward way of saying ice with these basic shapes. Mm -hmm. So when I came up with these white lines, just showing that it's a transparent surface. That was that was it. That's all I needed. In my mind, you know, I don't care if everybody sees the ice, but for me to feel like the feel the ice, those white lines did it for me. So that was an invention at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the most exciting thing of the whole process for me, is when I can find a visual, I guess you'd call it a metaphor or something that I'm trying to express and it's separate from it far enough to be almost, I don't know what the word to use, obscure, slightly obscure. Mm -hmm. I had a poetry professor years ago that said that the way you should, uh, the way you could analyze the meaning of a poem was to look for the part of it that didn't fit, the mm -hmm. thing that just didn't fit with everything else. Because that's something the person that wrote the poem included, because they wanted to get that point across, right? It just, I've used that so many times in my life when I'm looking at art or anything else. So that little bit of obscurity that you kind of have to mentally, conceptually move to uh, understand what you're looking at or hearing, mm -hmm. that's the moment for me. You know, that's the moment I'm looking for. I'm looking for that moment when you might stand in front of my work and see something that's so abstract that you, you know it's not real, but that it, it pushes you towards a memory mm -hmm. that's very strong. Mm -hmm. uh, and you then project the memory onto these abstract shapes. Mm -hmm. I guess that it's a way of describing what I'm doing. <laughs> um, I have a question. Um, so, are those lines, those white lines on the eyes, are those rice paper? Um... No. Uh, these are paint. So, mm -hmm. in a painting, I will mm -hmm. go back and I'll paint over the paper. Mm -hmm. The paper is just the structure, mm -hmm. and I have no problem with painting over it completely. You know, sometimes Same. I just take it out. There are places mm -hmm. here where it's been taken out. I don't know if I can find one quickly. <laughs> um, but there's places that I just simply painted over. So uh, like this is a piece of paper right here. Mm -hmm. um, so the lines are paint. Mm -hmm. Certainly, it looks like there's very, well, a lot of layers under them. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, there, yeah, there are. And that's that's one of the things that, one of the reasons I really enjoy doing water. Mm -hmm. uh, and besides the fact that I live on this, this beautiful river. <laughs> Uh, I, I like the, thinking about different ways, again, to find a metaphor for transparency. So mm -hmm. this line communicates transparency, mm -hmm. but why, you know, well, it's a, because it's a barrier between you and what's going on behind it, mm -hmm. right? So it's a, a metaphor for ice. Anyway, and what's actually going on here is there's a merganser chasing a fish. Oh. <laughs> This is a merganser, and uh -huh. this is the fish. And these were, again, shapes that were not intended to be those things. They were just, I was able to build these things out of the shapes I had. Mm -hmm. Well, this is from a real experience. This view is what's outside my window over here. There's mm -hmm. a dam, a broken dam in the river, and it's right out there. 
and I was looking out there and I don't know if you know what a merganser is, but they're a red-headed duck mm -hmm. and they have a kind of a flip duck tail on their head. Mm -hmm. And the, I think I know. The, the females, the females are wonderful. Mm -hmm. And they look a little bit, the males are kind of white and kind of chunky and, you know, but the females, <laughs> are, they're built for speed. They're mm -hmm. gorgeous. They have this wonderful little red head with this flip that comes out the back and they fish underwater. Well, because I'm so far above the river, I can mm -hmm. see them. I can see them chasing fish under the water because I'm looking down on it, you know, mm -hmm. if the lights are up. So that's what motivated this image. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. That's really beautiful. Thank you. Oh. Well, um, in your own experience and what you've learned on your way, whether it's technique or just life in general, would you mind telling us or our viewers um, some advice if you have um, to anyone who's looking for it in, I would say, joining the art world or becoming an artist themselves um, or um, just learning watercolor? That was my advice. Uh, when, when I read that question, the first thing I thought of is life is long. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm, I'm a lot older than most artists, and yet I, 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 I have the emotions of an, emer an emerging artist because I haven't had that much experience in public. I've been mm -hmm. painting for 50 years, and I really haven't been public in that period of time. Mm -hmm. So, um, first thing I would say is life is long. You know, don't be in such a hurry. <laughs> Relax. Uh -huh. And it's easier to find your way. Mm -hmm. um, the things you do today will mm -hmm. bear fruit in the future. Mm -hmm. That's very hard to understand when you're younger, that this thing you did 20 years ago may pop up. Like for instance, the way I work with this collage. Uh -huh. Well, when I was so young, I wasn't going to school. I would take cardboard, I used to put cardboard inside shirts when you get them back from the laundry. I'd take that gray cardboard and I'd give it to my dad. I'd say, Dad, draw a clock on this. And he would draw the clock and then I would cut it out and I'd cut out hands and I'd make myself a clock. You know, I would make the object just out of cardboard. Mm -hmm. I made these big spaceships and you know, everything out of cardboard. So, uh, Though cutting a paper, cutting that cardboard out, and 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 imagining and pretending that it was something real, that's what I'm doing today. I'm cutting <laughs> out these pieces of rice paper, drawing on them, and saying, "What could this be if it were real? What mm -hmm. could it be? His leg? Could it be? You know, right? So it's kind of amazing that you know when I when I realized that I was doing this fifty years. Lo a long time later <laughs> mm -hmm. than when I had originally started. Mm -hmm. So life is long. What you do today has implications for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, focus on the things that sustain you mm -hmm. because there'll be a lot of problems along the way. <laughs> so you need to understand and find the things that, that sustain you, that mm -hmm. can keep you going during the bad times. <laughs> There's always bad times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there should be bad times. Yeah. Was... Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I guess that's what I'd say. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think for now, I don't have further questions for you, but if there's anything you want to tell us with the viewers, anything that's still lingering in your mind, you can feel free, feel free to share. Um, but, um, mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't, I, you know, I, I, excuse me, you don't know. I, I don't really, I, I've already said too much. <laughs> <laughs> Good to enjoy your rest of your day. Okay. I will be also interviewing, I believe it's your wife. Um, yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you, Christine. It's been my pleasure. I think it's my pleasure. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
As always, we would like to thank our sponsors for giving us the opportunity to host this event.